Hello, everybody. All right, it is 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to give it just a, another minute or so, see who else comes to join. So we are getting started. I'm so excited because we are going to be, I'm going to be interviewing Ashley Turner today. Ashley Turner is a psychotherapist and yoga instructor in Los Angeles, and she's going to be talking to us about her fertility journey and how her spiritual practices helped her throughout this process. So we'll wait just a minute for her to, to join us. Geneva Diva, I see you. <laughs> Jenna, I wish you could talk to me. I want to hear about your move. <laughs> but I like your photos. I like your doggie. <clears throat> oh, my. learning how all this works. There she is. All right, Ashley. Gonna bring you in here. Hello. Hi. So sorry, I had to get my my phone. Like, yeah, a little glitch there. No worries. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Very good, very good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, totally. Good. Well, I am, I'm so super excited. And first of all, I just want to say congratulations to you because you are in your third trimester. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that later down the road. Um, but before we get started, I, I just want to say a little something. So this is really coming full circle for me because... When I first started teaching, maybe about 12 years ago, I took a workshop of yours in Chicago. And yes, it was on, that's right. And it was on the chakras. And I loved how you blended the, the science of the West with the ancient spiritual philosophical traditions of the East. And it, it was just such a stepping stone for me in my own journey and my own path. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know that I think that for many of us, when we're first getting started, you know, you, you go, you hit the mat, you come off and you're like, I feel great. And, and that's that. And that's fine. And then as your journey starts to progress, you want to understand more about what actually is happening in my body, what's going on mm -hmm. in my mind. And I just mm -hmm. love how you, 
you blended that bridge, you merged that bridge so beautifully. So thank mm. you for your contribution and, and thanks again for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Are you still in Chicago? No, I'm in New York. Okay. Nice. Yeah, I've been here for eight years. Awesome. Yay. So I would love for you to give us a little intro on yourself about your yoga journey, being a psychotherapist, and then, of course, merging that into your, your fertility story. So yeah, well, over to you. I, um, yeah, I've been teaching yoga for over 20 years, which is so radical. And, um, and when I started, I think the yoga practice really started healing me from the inside out. And I could feel the big shifts within myself, particularly healing me from, yeah, I wouldn't have called it being depressed at the time, but looking back, it definitely was what it was and low self-esteem. And, and so once I started really deepening into the practice, I wanted to understand how is it that I'm on the mat, you know, for an hour, hour and a half, and it's radically shifting my mood, even my personality traits, my perception. Um, so I started studying, uh, I always was studying Ram Das, who was a mm. psychotherapist, a Harvard trained psychologist, and then went mm -hmm. and discovered yoga. So that he's been one of my greatest influences. And I was studying that along with starting vinyasa yoga when I started out. Um, and so then I decided to go back to school and get my master's in psychology, because not only for myself was I seeing these shifts, but then once my students started, I started teaching, I, I was seeing my students having these massive shifts and aha moments on the yoga mat and emotional breakthroughs and breakdowns. And I, again, really wanted to understand more from the Western psychological model, how, what is this connection of mind body like and breath? Um, so I got my master's, I got licensed as a psychotherapist. I wrote my master's thesis on the integration of yoga and psychology. Uh -huh. And then um, shortly after that, I uh, got licensed and then, um, and then started my program, Yoga Psyche Soul, which is a six month program that integrates neuroscience, yoga, psychology, depth, depth psychology in particular, meditation, breath work, um, in a really, hopefully really applicable way, because I think that I truly believe yoga, meditation, breath work are some of the most effective tools that we have for healing. And so to be able to bring that into the mainstream, whether it's the medical system, we have a lot of educators that come to our program, of course, a lot of psychology professionals, um, as well as yoga teachers who want to understand how to integrate and offer their students a much more in-depth transformative practice through psychology skills and tools. So that's where I am now. It's been amazing. And um, yeah, I'm just really grateful. Yeah. So I'm eight months pregnant, which is amazing. incredible. And that's been a very in, intense and wild journey for this lifetime. So of course, it's all been a huge practice for me to just keep surrendering to that path. I think anyone that's had a fertility, any parent, you know, but anyone that's had a fertility journey really knows the, just the level of surrender that you have to have. And it's, it's not easy, you know, for most yeah. of us, I don't want to speak for everyone, but it's really not easy. It's challenging. It's definitely been the biggest challenge in my life for sure. Can you, can you talk about that? Can you talk about your road to pregnancy and fertility? And I'm sure there are lots of ups and downs and twists and turns and yeah, um, I, you know, I always wanted to have a child. It was always like a top, top, probably the number one priority was to have a family. So I came from a really loving, amazing family. I'm very blessed in that way. Um, I came from central Illinois and, and oh, not really? just my, yeah. Oh, I, wow, I, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Bloomington, Illinois. Okay, I'm from Chicago originally, so. Yeah. All right, Midwest is best. Yes, <laughs> Midwest is best, totally. Yeah. So I, you know, I was very blessed that I had an incredible nuclear family, but then also extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, we were all really close. And that was just what I always wanted for my life. And then I came out to USC and I was at a, in LA and, um, you know, pursuing my career and just really self-actualizing, you know, that was a huge part, but I always, you know, my top priority was always having a family. So even in my twenties, you know, when I was in a relationship, I, we were already talking about getting married and having kids. And then we broke up and I remember being so heartbroken because I was ready to, you know, start a family with him. 
So it really all through my 30s was just about finding my man and finding a partner that wanted to have a family and that was the right partner, of course. And I was with someone for the, you know, from 35 to 40 who was amazing, but he was just ambivalent and couldn't really get on board with having a child or not. And at that point, it was definitely leaning towards, you know, fertility treatments and he just couldn't get on board with it. So we broke up once, we got back together, and then we ended up breaking up again because he just wasn't ready. And I knew that I had to move on and either find a partner or potentially do it on my own. So that was a huge crossroads. I came back, he was living in Aspen, said so we were living in Aspen for a while together. And so I came back, moved back to LA. And so at um, that point, can I ask, at that point, had you started going through fertility treatments or that was just something that was on the table in terms of discussion? Yeah, I froze my eggs when I was 37. Okay. So I was really blessed that, you know, I, even at the time, you know, several years ago, there, there was not much talk about freezing your eggs and not a lot of people, I don't think we're doing it. You know, this was like five years ago, more than that. And um, my sister did. And so it kind of like woke me up like, oh, I guess it's something I really need to look into because I felt like, oh, I'm still, you know, I think it's tricky for my generation because, you know, we've been out there, we've been living our lives, doing our thing, and maybe we don't feel like we're even ready to, you know, slow down and start a family at 32 or 35 or 38. And so there's a lot of, I wouldn't say maybe mixed messages, but I don't think that there's there wasn't the dialogue that I think there is now around freezing your eggs and around if you're, um, you know, getting into your even early 30s, but certainly mid 30s um, to really consider that as an option because the the age does make a difference in the quality of the eggs. And that's something that I just, you know, there's so there are so many mixed messages. I remember telling, you know, people that and they're like, oh, you're a yogi, you're in such great shape, you, you eat so well, you'll be fine. And that's not the whole story. You know, it's really a, a much bigger, more intricate fertility is a much bigger story than that. And the age can really make a difference. Um, so luckily, I did freeze my eggs. And, um, and that was part of my with that boyfriend, I said, well, okay, if you're not ready to have a child, then I, I need to freeze my eggs and can you help me out with that? And he did, which was amazing. Um, and so, but even so, I still wanted to get on that journey because it can be a long journey. And it was a long journey from me, for me after that. So then we broke up, I came back to LA, I was here and um, looking, I, I decided, okay, I'm gonna do one last sort of let, Hail Mary letter to the universe and really like call in my partner and give myself a little bit of time, like a few months, really only a few months, because I was like, I'm not, you know, going on a long journey again with partner, like, I'm going to really decide if I need to do this on my own. And I went back on online dating. And soon after that, I met my partner now, but I was so crystal clear. And when I wrote like my sort of profile in online dating, I was crystal clear saying I if you don't want to have a child and potentially get married in the near future, we're not a match. You know, if you're not um, looking at relationship as a vehicle for consciousness and spiritual evolution, or you don't know what I'm talking about, we're not a match. And so it automatically weeds out, you know, 90% of people because they're like, holy shit, she wants to have a kid right now. No fucking way, you know? So I was like, great, because I don't even want to talk to that person. Like exactly. And one of, um, hi, Jen, I see Jen on here. Um, one of uh, the teachers that I've worked with, um, Alison Armstrong, is incredible. Because I'm saying this because I know there are a lot of women out there who are looking for their partner and who are really seeking that partner to have children with. And at some point, and I reached this point several times, we come to a crossroads where it's like, what's more important? Is it to have a relationship or is it to have your child. And for me, I got to the point where I was like, I will have a child on my own. And it wasn't coming, you know, of course, I had so many people saying, Are you sure you don't just want to have a child because of all the conditioning and da 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 da. It's like, I've worked through that in my early 30s. Like, <laughs> I already did that exploration. This is not just a conditioning thing. This is not just a should have a family thing. This is like a very deep, 
yearning. I'm also a cancer, so, you know, home and family is everything to me and um, always has been. It's where I thrive. It's my domain. And every, it's not like that for everyone. You know, I have a lot of friends who um, maybe would have or wanted to have a child, but it wasn't that important to them. So this was always a driving dharmic call for me. And that's how I knew. And I had to keep having that conversation with my soul, really, and with spirit um, to the point where I walked away from an amazing relationship with my boyfriend in Aspen twice, you know, and then I met my partner now. We broke up once because he was in and then he was out. He didn't want to, you know, he was getting his MBA and he felt overwhelmed and decided maybe he wasn't ready to have a child. So, you know, a year and a half in, we totally broke up again. And at that point, this is several years ago, I was so clear and it just was, you know, I said, I'm going to go on a little bit of a spiritual sojourn and I'm going to get really clear with myself and see if this is, if that calling is still there. And it was. And so I figured, okay, whatever it takes, if I have to move out of LA to someplace that's less expensive and have my mom move somewhere with me or, you know, whatever it takes, I have, I'll do it to have a child on my own. And, and so he and I had broken up and we were apart for a few months. And then um, I had actually met someone else and was kind of falling in love. And he totally came back around and was like, okay, I'm ready, you know, it's that crazy Layla, Leela of the universe mm -hmm, like, the joke mm -hmm. of like when I fully let go and walked away and we weren't even in touch, you know, he, he circled back around and was like, okay, let's do this. So then we started our own, you know, like really doing all the fertility treatments. And that was another, that was uh, two and a half years ago. So that was like, how old were you then? Um, 43. Okay. So that was still a long process of, um, you know, I found out I had a, you know, sort of birth defect in my uterus, septate uterus, and then all these other things started to reveal themselves. So, you know, on the <clears> fertility <throat> journey, you just don't know. There's so many factors and it's such a, it's such a miracle, you know, human life. It's really, truly such a miracle. I know some people get pregnant really easily and it seems like it's not that big of a deal, but when you experience challenges with fertility, you realize like, wow, even the fact that I'm sitting here right now, you're sitting there, that we're alive in these human bodies is a human great body mystical. Is unbelievable. Yeah, it's yes. a great mystical um, miracle. And mm -hmm. it's not to be taken for granted. And so in the midst of my fertility journey and treatments, my father was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And then I went home and was with him for several months and midwifed him through his death, ultimately. And so that prolonged, you know, the fertility journey. And then um, so it just kept getting pushed back. And it really was like, wow, what else could possibly happen? Like, fuck, I've surrendered so much. I just have to keep surrendering, you know? So that's, uh, that's the nutshell of it. And so then we, um, you know, we did an embryo transfer in December and, and really it, we're so blessed. So, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That's Thank amazing. You. Um, I was listening to some of your podcasts and the most recent one that I listened to, you were talking about COVID and you were talking about how to deal with the emotions that are coming up, particularly when there's crisis. And one thing you said that's just stuck out to me was that when you're, when you're going through crisis now more than ever is the time to double down on your spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, well, first I'd like to, to talk and learn more about, with your background, being a yogi, knowing what you know from the psychological perspective, you know, you, I'm sure you have your ingrained practices that have supported you or that supported you up until that point. And I'm, I'm curious to know what you took with you. Um, I'm curious to know what changed while you were going through that. And then I'd also like to know, you know, if you could speak to why is it so important that when you're going through such tumultuous times, it's important to, to double down on those practices. Mm -hmm. Well, I just think that, you know, the end of the day, the, the whole game is all about you and you and the whole thing, you know, we're living life. We all have our different karmas. We all have the different, um, life less soul lessons that we're here to learn. And it's a little different for everyone. You know, one of my big ones happened to be the fertility journey still is, you know, still a very deep practice of surrender. And, um, 
so first of all, whatever it is, it's to ask the right questions and look at things not as like, why me? Or, you know, why is this happening? But instead, what are the lessons that I'm learning here? You know, what, what are the spiritual soul lessons that I'm being called to awaken to? And so it changes the whole dynamic of the game. And, it, and we don't take things so personally or hopefully get quite so invested or triggered. I mean, we do, of course, but then hopefully we can pull back and have a little bit more neutrality and then um, come at it from that spiritual lens. So I think that's really important. But the only way to do that is if we keep plugging into this largest sense of self. And that's the sense of me as a spirit, me as a soul that, you know, in yoga, I, the, yoga really only asks us one question. And that question is, who am I? And when we're identifying ourselves as this individual you know, me, Ashley, yoga teacher, therapist in Los Angeles, it's very easy to take things personally and get caught up in the melodrama. But when we can identify ourselves as spirit or as a soul having this human experience, the questions in the dialogue begins to change. And it's like, okay, we cultivate more curiosity, we cultivate less, you know, more non judgment, um, hopefully, you know, more compassion. And that's and and less attachment because we realize like this is the game of life you never know what curveball life is going to throw you i mean <laughs> we're all living in the midst of covid like who could have ever predicted that um i i mean i remember feeling that the level of surrealness when my father was diagnosed with cancer like whoa this is out of nowhere like we never saw this one coming um no one ever sees a health you know medical diagnosis like that coming so you know, and along the fertility journey, there were so many different markers along the way. That's like, are you kidding me? Another thing I have to, you know, oh, I have a genetic, you know. And that's what I want to know, which is that, you know, I think for myself um, and, and my own process and my own journey, you know, intellectually, I know a lot of things. I, I know, you know, I know that the practice is good for me. I know that to get on my meditation cushion is good for me. You know, I, I know all of these things. And then when shit hits the fan, it, it just takes you to another level. And, mm -hmm. and like you said, you know, you, you're brought back to this place of surrender, surrender, when all you want to do is hang on and control for dear life, because you feel like everything is out of your control. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm curious to know, in those moments when you know, your intellectual brain is, is it, it knows better, but in the midst of that chaos, um, how to how to talk yourself through that yeah i think that the biggest thing for me and i i said this in the beginning you know ram das is one of my great teachers and i just actually got a package from them because i bought a t-shirt and I, I had a little postcard in there um that just said forget about the past forget about the future just be here now mm -hmm. and of course that's his slogan be here now and but really that's the game because and so for me i've also been deepening my my studies a lot in mindfulness and doing a whole mindfulness certification with Jack Cornfield and Tara mm -hmm. Brock and mm -hmm. um, which dovetails, you know, incredibly with yoga, but the, the tool for me that I think is the most helpful is the witness mind and mm -hmm. curiosity. And so, and, and so like, wow, isn't this interesting? Okay. I'm curious about this. What is happening right now? Like to, to become, so the present moment comes into high relief and you let go of expectations of what the, pre the future or the past was going to be or is going to be. And you really wake up and enliven to what is in this moment. And I felt that so strongly with um, when my father was dying and I had never witnessed someone dying and I'd never been close to someone, you know, on a cancer journey. And there were so many, th I mean, even the moment we got this, you know, he was diagnosed and then he passed away about a year later, but um, we thought maybe he was going to be okay for, you know, five to seven years or we'd have some time. And then about three months, two months before he died, we got the diagnosis that actually he had a really aggressive form of multiple myeloma. And I remember getting that diagnosis. We were up in Northwestern and I was actually the only one there. I had flown in first and my sisters weren't there yet. And um, 
so I was in the room with the doctor by myself. My father was in the hospital room. And it was like a sh total shell shock. Like, if you guys do nothing, he has two weeks to live. And we're like, whoa, what? We thought we had like maybe 10 years, you know, like, oh my God, you know? And that was definitely the most surreal moment of my life. And, and I remember, you know, everything, it's like a movie, you know, everything just becomes like slow motion and I'm like hyperventilating and I'm just like trying to even wrap my head around it. And in those moments, like all you can do is just like breathe. Br the breath always brings us to the present moment. So I'm immediately, I always turn to the breath and slowing down and smoothing out my breath so that I can regulate my nervous system and at least stay somewhat steady and just cultivate non-judgment and like, whoa, okay. And then the mindful tools or the witness mind questions like, isn't this interesting? Like, okay, whoa, wow. You know, I remember going down the escalator and trying to, you know, I called my boyfriend and, and then I called my brother-in-law because my sisters weren't available. <laughs> like, I'm on this corner, you know, in downtown Chicago, like I remember it was springtime and I'm looking at the flowers and I'm like, you know, just trying to, to stand up, you know, and, and that's, there's times like that where that's all we can do. It's like, we don't, we can't ask ourselves to be like masterful or have some enlightened perception. It's like, this is fucked. You know, this is crazy. I can't believe and to this is happening. That. Yeah. And just be in that moment and be present with that and notice what's happening in your body. And notice, I remember, you know, noticing again, like, the breeze or the flowers or the people walking by, you know, so presence and the breath guides you to presence because the breath is only ever in the present moment. The breath is not in the past. The breath is not in the future. So, you know, the breath for me is the greatest tool and then just cultivating presence. So like walking back into my father's hospital room, you know, being so acutely aware of him, of his body, of the smell of him, of the look, view out the window, like just cultivating presence and non-judgment and allowing whatever comes up. Of course, there's a whole mixed bag. There's anger, there's rage, there's disbelief, there's bargaining, there's, you know, grief, there's all of it. And just observing okay what interesting you know then a few weeks later as he was going through his death process it it was you know i was there in the house with him and and it was so wild it was just like nobody talks about the process of dying you know of like sort of conscious dying and i didn't know that there could be all these kind of side effects and like he had a psychosis like just you know, as cancer's taking over your body, it's, it's different for everyone, of course, but there's all these different phases that you go through. And it was so wild, even for me, who, you know, has done so many ayahuasca journeys and so many, you know, sweat lodges, and like all these kinds of experiences of altered states, you know, MDMA or whatever. And to, to witness this, to witness death and, and, and be curious about it and stay awake. That was just my only goal was to stay awake moment to moment, day to day. Let me be as present as I can with him. Let me be as mindful as possible. Let me stay in my breath. And, you know, I didn't ask a lot more of myself. It's like, I'm not going to have some high, holy, you know, I was barely meditating. You know, I wasn't met really bad. I couldn't even really sit, sit on in front of my altar at his house and meditate. I would go for walks and nature was very healing and the same with the fertility journey, you know, when it's been just so intense, it's like, I haven't had, you know, sort of heightened um, interpretations, like, yeah, there have been moments of clarity and, and lucidity, but for the most part, it's like, and this too, you know, and I'm curious about this moment too. And now what's next? And how do I feel now? And mm -hmm. having so much compassion and holding ourselves really gently um definitely resourcing yourself you know whatever your resources are so for me certainly nature 
um, definitely my breath, definitely chanting, you know, listening to chants. Um, uh, certainly my circle of friends and colleagues and peers that I can reach out to and get support. And then I also have a whole host of professional, you know, guidance from my therapist to my high performance coach to, you know, in, in that time, you know, with my father, I reached out to a psychic and I reached out to another woman who midwives people through death. And, you know, obviously on the fertility journey, I'm reaching out to different fertility experts. So you definitely want to resource yourself and know that you have people and tools that you can seek and connect with. But ultimately, for me, it's that witness mind, non judgment, curiosity, um, and the breath. Absolutely. Exactly. You also talked about visualization. Uh, I read in one of your posts recently that that was a, a big tool that you used. Can you talk about that? Mm. Um, are you talking about on the fertility journey or? With... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think visualization is a really important tool because it helps to hone our attention and the mind because the mind can just easily spin all over and go into these thought loops and really get trapped in what we call mind traps. And so for me, I, honestly, the most simple, the simplest visualization, visualization that I do almost all the time is to pull my energy back to my center line, my central channel or Sushumna Nadhi. And in the yoga practice, there's the central channel of the energetic body that really connects us. And then all the chakras are born from there. But one of my teachers, Deborah Silverman, who's an astrologist, and I, I love this um, perspective that she has and the way that she named it, which is just that it's all about you and you. So you could think of it like it's about your inner child and your highest wisdom self, or it's about your individual, this human ego sense of self and your highest spiritual nature. And so I kind of think of it like the seventh chakra sense of self, like the self that's connected with the transcendent unity consciousness, and then this humanity that's, that's running out all these trips and going through all these experiences. And so when I visualize that central channel, I connect this, I usually feel it from my heart or my belly, and then, and then pull that energy up and connect to my highest sense of self, spirit, um, perception it's really opening the third eye perspective so you're seeing things not just from the two eyes of right and wrong good and bad but you're able to see that third perspective of both can be true at the same time you know witnessing my father die was one of the most awe-inspiring things and one of the most horrific things I experienced but at the same time it, it, it was a miracle and it was there was so much beauty in that and there was so much deep love in that. And so can you hold the full spectrum of the experience, you know, and sometimes that's easier than others, of course, but I think the visualization of where you're placing your energy and so that first step of the central channel and connecting to your highest sense of self connecting to spirit, really feeling like you can plug into a higher source. You can plug into source energy to, you know, think of it like plugging your computer into the wall socket or, you know, turning on your Wi-Fi and, and connecting to the internet. Like you have access to a larger state of consciousness. And it's really important that we find ways that plug us in. That might be different for, it's different for every person. Um, for me, definitely visualization, spirituality, um, meditation, nature are ways that I plug in. And also prayer, just asking for support. I'm in that process right now of just like, please help, you know, connecting to grace or your spirit guides or um, maybe guardian angels. Or I, I really like the visualization of spirit guides that we have guides with us and another person. If you're in a challenging situation with someone else, you know, they have their own spirit guides. And so calling both of you individually together, but then also calling in your spirit guides. So there's sort of an army at work, at play, so we don't feel so alone. So visualization in that sense is really helpful. Um, in terms of fertility, certainly connecting to my spirit baby and trusting that 
whatever soul is supposed to come through me is going to come through me in whatever way that they choose that is the right way. So it's, it's back very today, difficult. You have surrender. Um, yeah, surrender. And there's a great book called Spirit Babies, which is really helpful for me. It was a great psychic and he his specialty was connecting with spirit babies, you know, that haven't been born in this lifetime yet. So um, he has all these amazing stories of working with couples and working with women and and being able to hear and converse with the spirit baby to what were the lessons that that soul needed to play out or they need to play out with the parents or it was too loud in the city and once the parents moved to the country, all of a sudden they got pregnant or, you know, they were cleaning up a past life karma and then all of a sudden that happened. They were able to come through in this lifetime. So there's, it just helps again, put it in that sort of third eye perspective of there's so many dimensions at play and we don't know, we can't necessarily grok all of those. And same with my father, like, okay, this is his time, you know, this is wild, it feels too early or infertility, it feels too late. Like, where's my child? You know, how does everybody else just happen to find their man and get pregnant so easily? Like, that's not fair, you know? Um, but looking at it from that different lens of like, okay, how can I use this in service? So visualization is key connecting to those spiritual tools and spiritual beings, you know, non-physical beings that can really support us as well. And I love what you said about coming back to the breath, because I think that for a lot of people that are going through this process, and especially going through fertility treatments, I mean, that's just a big, tall order on its own. And, and it might also be the first time that people are having actual visceral experiences in their body. So, you know, you have the, the hormones and then, you know, everything that comes along with just fertility planning and then what's happening in your body. And I think people are sometimes looking for relief because, because it can be so overwhelming. And so that instruction of coming back to your breath, because it is the most direct experience to get you embodied, you know, because I think so often we're kind of, we're grasping, we're grasping, we're grasping. Um, and I like, I like those practices of breathing, visualizing, you know, w walks through nature, because those are things that we can all do that are, that are accessible, you know, and, and we don't have to be, um, I think, I think also, you know, not everybody is a, a yoga practitioner. And so, you know, they're looking for tools to, to ground them through that process and they just don't have the information yet. And so I like those simple things where, you know, they can make it a part of their daily life. Yeah, I think if you if you really um, understand just the basics of the nervous system that, you know, also for on the fertility journey, you know, one of the biggest um, in any health journey, you know, one of the biggest aims is that we reduce inflammation and we keep our physical body in a state of homeostasis and we stay as much as possible in that um, uh, rest and digest. Right. Yeah, parasympathetic nervous system. And we notice, we start to notice the symptoms of when we're in that fight or flight, when we get kicked into anxiety or, um, you know, any kind of heightened state and how we can self-soothe and calm ourselves down and bring ourselves back into a more grounded, calm state. And the number one tool is deep breathing. So deep belly breaths, it's really important that you're breathing all the way down into your belly. So you can just take your hands to your belly and really feel as you inhale that you're expanding out like a Buddha belly or like a Santa Claus belly, like you're really widening all the way down into the belly. And then exhaling in the same way and preferably inhaling and exhaling only through the nose. And then again, inhaling, fill the belly completely for four, three, keep going, two, keep inhaling, one. And then exhaling for four, three, two, one, and we'll do one more. So hands on the belly, inhale for four, three, two, one, and then exhaling for four, three, two, one. So that diaphragmatic breathing is one of the quickest ways, immediate ways to shift your body into the parasympathetic state. So that, I mean, it, it has nothing to do with yoga. It's just starting to tone the vagal nerve, starting to, it immediately reduces inflammation. 
it starts to shift the hormonal um, secretion and release in the bloodstream so that you're in a more calm, open state. So that diaphragmatic breathing is important. Also, you can visualize it like filling your womb space for women and for men. Um, that second chakra of the sexual organs really feel, I like, to, again, to use the visualization of like you're inflating a balloon from the inside out. And so maybe you're inflating that womb, you're, and you're automatically going to start to increase the blood flow there. So that's really important. And on the fertility journey, again, nothing to do with yoga, but on the fertility and everything to do with yoga, but on the fertility journey, again, one of the aims is to regulate our hormones and particularly the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the adrenals. And so when the adrenaline starts pumping and our adrenals get activated, the pituitary gland is sending that message to the adrenals to activate and kick us into that stress response. So the deep breathing can start to slow down and regulate the HPA axis and then start to um, reduce the stress hormones and activate the feel good hormones of oxytocin, serotonin. Um, and that's really important. And that's why when you're on the fertility journey, you hear like reduce your stress, you know, all these things. And it's like, fuck you. How can I reduce my stress when I'm like trying to get pregnant, you know, and do all these things. It's like really maddening. Actually, I find that really maddening, but, um, it is helpful to reduce any external stressors and know that there is a lot you can do to, um, to cultivate a more sattvic or a more balanced state in your body mind and the breath is number one, big diaphragmatic breathing. There's also a lot of science around what's called coherent breathing. Coherent breathing is really actually what we just did, which is has been proven to be the most optimal ratio of breath, which is super simple, four counts in and four counts out. So that's just a great tool for you guys to take away. Four counts in nice and slow, four counts out nice and slowly. It stretches it out to about six counts, uh, sorry, six breaths a minute, which has been proven. There's a lot of scientific studies and Patricia Grabarg is a great scientist on the East Coast that's done a lot of breath research. I was just studying with her. And um, anyway, so that tool is important. You can also Google coherent breathing. There's also soundtracks. There's a whole website. I think it's maybe coherentbreathing.com. But with different soundtracks where you get a, you know, a chime going four counts up and then four counts down. So you can really follow that for 10 or 15 minutes. Ideally, if you can do coherent breathing seven, eight minutes a day, um, that's really helpful. So it's just four counts in and out. Amazing. I love to know, knowing where you are now on your journey, on your path, is there anything that you wish you would have known then that you now know? You know, what, mm -hmm. would, what would you tell your, yourself, you know, a couple of years ago or even just a couple of months ago? Um, when you were when you were on this path? Um, I think that, you know, the biggest teaching for me is certainly that I'm not in control. <laughs> like, we're not in control of these external circumstances of if we find the right partner, or what our fertility, you know, is going to look like, or when and if this child is going to come through my body or what my relationship is going to be like. It's just, there's so much. And I mean, it's the radical teaching of life. So I think to um, release those expectations earlier. And I feel like I was always very mindful and very, you know, conscious about being on uh, an intentional path of having a child and cultivating that kind of relationship. But even so, it just didn't happen for me until later in life. Um, I do wish that there was more talk at my, you know, my generation, like 10 years ago, of freezing your eggs. And I think that that's a really important conversation for us to be having now for women in their 30s to consider that as an option. Um, and I actually asked one of my fertility doctors, what would you tell your daughter? You know, because I was really kind of outraged that no one had, I was very close to my gynecologist and she was very, she's very holistic and she knew how badly I wanted to have children. And she never like sat me down and said, Hey, you're 33 or you're 35 or you're 37. 
you really need to let's talk about Consider how your these options, you know, and she never did that. And I would have hoped and expected and wanted that, you know, luckily, I got the message elsewhere. But I feel like it's really important that we increase this dialogue around fertility, you know, eliminating all the shame and there's so much mm -hmm. shame. Yeah, you know, women are just shamed about our bodies, whether it's you know, first body type, body image, you know, and then and what aging, it's supposed to do and at fertility. what age it's supposed to do it. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's so messed up, but, um, I think that it's really important and I want to be a huge advocate going forward of demystifying and destigmatizing the fertility journey. Um, you know, not calling it infertility. Number one, that's a big piece of languaging. That's very important to me that it's a fertility journey and everyone's looks different. And, you know, it's hard when all of your friends around you are just either they don't care about having kids and they're just like cool with it. And you're sitting there yearning and heartbroken or the other side is all the people that found their partner in their twenties and got married in their, you know, and then they had their one or two popped out one or two or three kids. And it's like, you're, you're in this no man's land and you, it can be very isolating. And so it's very important that, we keep having these dialogues to really support each other and really normalize, you know, the full spectrum of what one's fertility journey or journey to parenthood looks like, because it doesn't always mean, of course, having um, birthing a child through your own body. And that's fine too, you know? So I do wish that, that I had learned about freezing my eggs or really investigated it earlier in my thirties and, and maybe even frozen more eggs, you know, like that. Um, so I wish there was a bigger dialogue around that for sure. More education for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Amazing. Which I think is happening. I think it's happening now in this millennial generation. And I was sort of in that generation in between where there was still sort of some stigma and not a lot of, um, you know, the science has changed so much even in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, I kind of got caught in that. I really do feel like our gener my generation was, that in between where we were taught to go out and self actualize and do whatever we want in our careers and have these big lives. But then maybe, and, and again, I do feel like I was very intentional of having a family, but you know, we turned to that later than other generations in the past, you know, where they were definitely getting pregnant in their twenties and really focused on that. And so when it gets pushed back later, sociologically, our body, our physiology hasn't caught up to our sociological um, current system. And so it's important to understand that discrepancy and to address that if you are really intentional about having a child, um, you know, and I coach my psychotherapy clients on that. Um, and just to really help educate them on that. Like if this is something you're interested in, it's definitely something you might want to consider freezing your eggs. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for opening up and, and sharing your journey. I know a lot of people appreciate this. And like you said, I think it's important to, to share our stories and, and, and make this a less isolating experience because it really mm -hmm. can be. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Um, can you tell us where to find you and where we can find your courses and yeah. what to be expecting from you yeah, as you're you expecting? So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Lauren. Yeah, my, um, my website is ashleyturner.co, ashleyturner.co. Um, if you're interested in my yoga psychology program, it's yoga-psychology.co. You can also find it on ashleyturner.co, also on Instagram. Um, I have a free webinar free master class on over on the science of overcoming anxiety so for those of you who might be experiencing anxiety whether it's covid related or fertility related um that's coming up in a week or so so that's also at the link in my bio on instagram and um please dm me if you have any questions or comments absolutely thank you so much lauren amazing thank you when, when is your due date it's september september okay mm -hmm. very good all right well i'm rooting for you yeah. Thank you. And, um, Thank you so and much. I look forward to being in touch. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Very good. All right. Until Thank next time, all. until we meet again. Thank you.